ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Black Tower Show. I am your host, Nathan Ford. I'm joined by Jake Fox. How you doing over there, Jake? Good, how are you? Our guest today on the Black Tower Show, Jeff Charlotte. Jeff Charlotte is the nationally best-selling author of The Family, which was published 2008. A quote from Thomas Frank on the cover says, quote, of all the important studies of the American right, the family is undoubtedly the most eloquent. It is also quite possibly the most terrifying, end quote. The family, written by Jeff Charlotte, the secret fundamentalism at the heart of American power. The fundamentalist group, the family, has operated secretively with the help of influential congressmen and senators who are members of the group to promote their anti-gay, anti-abortion, pro-free market ideas in America and other parts of the world. Scandals involving people connected with the family. If you remember, Jake, Senator John Ensign and South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford brought public attention to the group. Jeff Charlotte, our guest on the Black Tower Show. Thank you, Jeff Charlotte, for taking the time to talk to us today. Hi, good to be with you. Let's start with a recap of what the family is and what it stands for. You've described it as elite fundamentalism. What do you mean by elite? Well, uh, you know, what everyone means by elite, it's made up uh, not of ordinary people, not of big revival meetings of the masses. It's not a Billy Graham group or Pat Robertson group or a televangelist group. It um, was founded way back in the middle of the New Deal when, uh, according to the founder, God gave to him and gave him a vision and said that uh, Christianity had been getting it wrong for 2,000 years by focusing on the poor and the suffering and the down and out, and that what God wanted him to do was to focus on those whom he called the up and out, the top men, the key men, these are all the terms that he used, um, and very literally the elites, the idea that you should go and you should uh, recruit into your movement congressmen, uh, business leaders, military leaders, um, uh, and that you'll then get a kind of a trickle-down fundamentalism. So usually when we think of fundamentalism, most people who aren't familiar with that world imagine it as a kind of uh, uneducated, uh, sometimes they make assumptions about rural poverty and those kinds of things, and this is a group whose membership is entirely comprised of uh, very successful, very powerful people. Our guest today on the Black Tower Show, Jeff Charlotte. We're broadcasting 1590 AM WASB, 1310 AM WRSB. If you'd like to call him, the number is 585 637 Four zero again five eight five six three seven seven zero four zero. So, Mr. Jeff Charlie, you talk about the families into the cultivation of powerful people. You just mentioned key men. Can you go in uh, into a little more description into who are these key men and how are they found? Uh, they, they find themselves. So, for instance, in the family, and uh, I should say, you've got to, I got to give a plug to the more recent book too, which is called C Street: um, uh, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. And that came out in 2010, and that's the one that tells the story of men like Senator John Ensign, Governor Mark Sanford, uh, uh, less remembered but actually more influential uh, former Representative Chip Pickering was also involved in a sex scandal in a house on Capitol Hill, on C Street in Capitol Hill, that is uh, at the time was registered as a church um, to avoid taxes and was used to provide housing and a meeting place for uh, the various political members. So, for instance, Senator Jim Inhofe, Republican of Oklahoma, uh, used to, by his own admission, he says, I I held all my foreign policy meetings there. When foreign diplomats wanted to meet with me, they had to go to C Street, and we had to say a prayer to Jesus. Um, Mm. The the group is different, again, than typical fundamentalism, in that it's not particularly bound by rules. Um, You know, if you, uh, this is not like a, you, you can't dance, you can't play cards, and you can't drink. You, you do whatever you want as long as you sort of give your loyalty to this concept of God. And right. any congressman is welcome. And I should say it's mm-hmm. mostly Republicans. Um, uh, um, Senator Mike Enzi from uh, Wyoming, Senator Tom Coburn also from Oklahoma. But there's also been Democrats. Um, Maybe one of the most prominent was uh, a Representative Bart Stupak from Michigan, who some listeners may remember was the guy who very nearly derailed uh, Obama's health care plan by uh, trying to stick anti-abortion measures into it, um, and had been a resident of the C Street House, had enjoyed that subsidized rent, uh, and was supported in his efforts by other very conservative Democrats, uh, 
one in particular that, that I think kind of sums it up is Senator Mark Pryor, the Democrat mm-hmm. from Arkansas. And I, I've, I've, I've interviewed Senator Pryor, uh, you know, and he, he'll talk openly about his, uh, his participation in this thing, uh, his idea that the separation of church and state is kind of a false concept. He's pro-war, anti-choice, anti-labor, anti-gay, um, uh, anti-market regulation, mm. anti-public schools, but he is a Democrat. You know, so you see those lines are not always quite as sharp, <laughs> right. but that is the idea that he's representing. It's a kind of combination of religious fundamentalism and free market fundamentalism. And any politician who finds themselves attracted to that, that worldview is, is welcome within the organization. Right. This fundamentalism um, doesn't seem to be um, biblical fundamentalism um, by the way you describe their beliefs. Their theology seems to be one of their own. They've kind of created their own offshoot cult, if you will, it sounds like. Yeah, and in fact, the, the inner circle, the, the, the idea of the, the movement is that it's represented on concentric rings. And Abraham Baridi, the founder, and his successor, a man named Doug Coe, will say, you know, just as you look in the Bible, you have Jesus and you have a couple closest to him, and then you have, you know, uh, uh, the 12 a little bit further out, and then you have those a little bit further out. So it is in the world. So there are those who really understand the theology and those who don't, and they want to work with you, whatever your understanding is, because they want access to that power. Um, At the inner circle, they are maybe more recognizable as traditional biblical fundamentalists, although even then, um, central to their thinking is an idea that, that many of them call biblical capitalism. And this is the idea that capitalism is, in fact, um, uh, laid out in very clear terms in the New Testament, and that you need only to read the New Testament uh, to discover this. And then uh, at, other, you know, at other sort of extremes of maybe fundamentalism that people would recognize, in my, in my book, Sea Street, and writing about for Harper's Magazine and reporting on various shows, I did a lot of reporting on the group is very international, I should say. Um, and they've always, in fact, focused on developing nations where they can have a lot of uh, influence. One of those was Uganda and East Africa. Uh, most Americans don't realize is one of the major recipients of U.S. foreign aid, is a key strategic uh, place, is really on the front lines of a lot of things. The leader of the Ugandan branch um, influenced, he said, by some of his mentors, like Senator Inhofe from uh, Oklahoma, um, uh, uh, John Ashcroft, he considered a, a something of a mentor, mm. introduced something called the Anti-Homosexuality Act, um, which thankfully hasn't passed yet because of international tension, but had it done so, would have been the most draconian anti-gay law in the world. Not just death penalty for homosexuality, uh, but years in prison for what's called the promotion of homosexuality, just talking about it now, Um, Mm. or even years in prison if you know a homosexual person, if you're not, but you know one and you fail to report them within 24 hours. So the bill didn't pass, although it did lead to a kind of a witch hunt within the nation. I went over to Uganda, spent time uh, with the author of the bill, and he explained um, very much, he said, this is not uh, something influenced by the family, this is something that was created by the family. I am the family. Okay. And it's important to note that there's, even within this group, it's, it's complicated. There's plenty of Americans who would say that goes much too far. Uh, that's not what we support at all. Even rabid anti-gay politicians like Senator Coburn uh, would denounce, you know, the death penalty and so on. But it's that kind of network of influence and power that makes such initiatives possible and really makes the group fundamentally an anti-democratic force in the world. Right. Since um, the family has been formed uh, during uh, the New Deal era, as you as you pointed out, we've had kind of a chronology of of events um, based around a, a couple of really vague uh, premises, like um, the war uh, against communism, where it brought us to it brought us to uh, all of these sorts of proxy wars and all sorts of horrible situations like Vietnam and, and, and Korea and, and things like that. And now we have the war on terror, which is bringing us all over all over the globe. How much influence has this has the family had on, on, had on these situations? You know, it's hard to measure, although I, I do like to point out to a survey uh, taken by uh, a sociologist named D. Michael Lindsay, who is a he's sort of a center-right kind of guy himself. He's no leftist critic of this. In fact, he's an admirer of some of the family's 
uh, things. He's a, at Rice University, and this was in a book published by Princeton University Press. And I say these things to sort of tell you where it's coming from. He interviewed 300 and I think it was 360 some uh, sort of Washington insiders, congressmen, but also some uh, State Department folks and so on, uh, and asked them to talk about uh, um, which religious groups in the Capitol Hill have the most uh, influence. Mm. The family won. Now, what was astonishing about this is this is a group that at that time, and uh, Professor Lindsay in his article for um, American Academy of Religion called it the Christian Mafia because they like to call themselves that term. They think it's sort of funny. At that time, the organization denied its own existence. When I first wrote The Family, based first on spending uh, about a month living with a group and then spending years sort of digging through their archives at the Billy Graham Center and Wheaton College and going around and interviewing people and attaching myself to, to members like Senator Sam Brownback. There's a chapter on him. When I, when I first did that, they would describe themselves as an invisible organization. And the leader, you can, uh, some of this stuff is now out in public. I managed to get videotape and audio tape and put it out there. You, so you can Google around and you'll find it online. Uh, describing themselves as working like the mafia. The more invisible you are, the more influence you have. Um, and that's true, the more invisible you are, the more influence you have, which is why we have lobbying laws. And if you go back to the early days of the family, you said that, you know, you mentioned the New Deal. They were formed as an anti-New Deal organization. That was what they thought God wanted them to do. They saw, they saw you know, the New Deal as this kind of the, the final Armageddon. Um, and they were fairly successful um, on the local level. When they began, they mm -hmm. began as essentially a, a campaign organization, for man, they met elected mayor of Seattle and then governor of Washington um, at a time when Washington, as it is now, then was a very progressive state. And then it went through a long period of deep conservatism. They broke the unions, uh, smashed all kinds of sort of poor people's organizing movements, and um, were, were very influential on that basis, moved you know, across the country to the other Washington. And you can see them. It's a little sort of Forrest Gump-like. They're there at every moment. So... Uh, you know, a rough chronology is 1947, which is the Taft-Hartley Act. This was the act that really undid so much of the New Deal, and that was the first thing they threw their muscle into. They weren't the only ones. And so when you talk about the influence, you have to remember that there's other factors, other people who are interested in these ideas, but they were bringing the religious energy to that. 1959, uh, as part of uh, the Cold War, that anti-communist struggle, a uh, guy named Senator Frank Carlson led a delegation of businessmen to Haiti to meet with a young politician they thought was maybe worthy of support. Senator Carlson and his colleagues were on the Foreign Affairs Committee, were in a position to send him money, which they did. They began the long, uh, mm. uh, very expensive relationship with Papa Doc Duvalier, who was perhaps, I, I don't think anyone right or left would, would dispute the notion of Papa Doc as maybe the most insane and brutal killer in the Western Hemisphere. Mm. Um, a very violent man, but they decided he was a man of God, and on and on it would go. In 1966, they threw their might behind uh, Suharto in Indonesia, who came to power by killing, according to the CIA, you know, bastion of leftist thinking, uh, killed about a million people in coming to power, a million of his own citizens. Uh, but he was also, uh, so Indonesia is an oil-rich country, and that's the connection they had. So again and again throughout, throughout history, you, you find them there. Not exactly provoking events, but adding the, the kind of the energy of religious justification to the really cold calculations. Of, of empire. Very dangerous, very dangerous. Our guest today on the Black Tower Show, Jeff Charlotte. We're broadcasting 1590 AM WASB, 1310 AM WRSB, Rochester, New York, upstate, Brockport, Canandaigua. You can hear us out there if you'd like to call in 585-637-7040. Our guest again, Jeff Charlotte, I'm joined by Jake Fox. How you doing over there, Jake? Good. Um, what you're describing is these people believe they're on a divine mission to um, really carry out this globalist uh, free market capitalism. Is, is yeah. that is that really what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, I, I don't know if they <laughs> quite put it in those <laughs> terms. But, you know, what, one of the, this is sort of like a wonky theological thing, but it helps you understand. The fundamentalists you see on TV, the televangelists, they tend to be what's called a pre-millennialist. And what this means, is that uh, they think Christ is going to come back any day. This is the left behind, you know, the apocalypse right. stuff, the rapture stuff. There's another theological tradition 
not always conservative, although they're very conservative in their hands, that says Christ can't come back till they can establish a thousand years of, of government around the world that would be worthy of Christ in their eyes. And that's what the core of this group is. So they're not waiting for Christ to show up, you know, next week. They're not those kinds of crazy, wild-eyed, rapture Christians. Mm. They're saying, look, and the, 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 the principles they need to put in place are free market. And the reason they do that, and they experience it, uh, it's important to remember, these are not, you know, evil men cackling in the back rooms about their, you know, this is not Dr. Evil. They don't experience themselves with that. In fact, right. they were always puzzled that I couldn't see the, you know, the wonders of their work. Because what they see free markets as doing, and, and by free market they mean... Um, very laissez-faire 19th century brutal markets is right. returning to everybody the power to make decisions for themselves decisions to follow god now this helps if you're a very wealthy man a businessman who's done very well and um uh as uh, say for instance um the uh, uh the former ceo of a giant energy corporation uh uh, uh, uh aes um uh, not quite Enron size, but close. Uh, Dennis Back, he's a long, long time member, and he sees himself as led by God to do right by his workers. Thus, the workers don't need any unions because he'll make the right decisions for his children. It's that kind of paternalism, right. which I just have to mention because I'm talking to Rochester, has an old Rochester connection. Um, and, and in the book The Family, I write about this a little bit coming out of the 19th century revivalist Charles Finney, who led a lot of his revivals, his businessmen's revivals, mm. uh, out there uh, in, in Rochester, um, and who also subscribed to this idea that there are men chosen by God for a certain kind of leadership, and all that's left to the rest of us is to um, uh, listen to them and take their orders. We talk a lot on the show about how big corporations and banks um, are affecting legislation and, and moving our country in this direction. Oftentimes we don't, you know, your book, The Family, illuminates this point that there, there are perhaps these people, these very religious fundamental people that are actually creating real change and directing our country unbeknownst to the people. We don't know that this is, this is perhaps why, um, you know, the health care reform almost got dismantled. This is why this is happening. It's, it's very devious to the American people, you know, the, and, and that's why it's so important that people should get your book and understand that this is, this is real uh, power that the family has. It, it is, and, and I think, you know, um, you know, the history of the book, you mentioned it came out in 2008 and did not make a big splash, although I've been writing about it for Harper's Magazine and Rolling Stone Magazine for a while. And then in 2009, those sex scandals uh, connected to C Street came up. Senator John Ensign, right. Governor Mark Sanford, both at the time were Republican presidential hopefuls. Sanford was pretty good. I mean, hmm. This race might look different right now. <laughs> Sanford hadn't uh, famously, if you'll recall, gone on the Appalachian Trail to see his mistress in Argentina and then lied about it. Mm -hmm. What was important was that the family uh, took a very active role in covering up those affairs. And suddenly, this group that had, you know, pretty much avoided scrutiny following the first publication of my book was in the public eye, and it just got worse for them. Uh, and, you know, I'm indebted to some, some other journalists like Rachel Maddow, who really figured this out and took it up and, and, you know, gave me the space to do the kind of reporting. And he didn't, so they did eventually go public and said, uh, you know, one of my, my favorite moments of my career was when a representative of the family went on the Rachel Maddow show to fight back against me and said, yes, we've been too secretive. Charlotte doesn't understand how powerful we really are, and the reason we're going public is because of Charlotte's book. So, you know, small <laughs> victories. I didn't actually shut them down, but I, I got them to admit something. A step in the it, right it's there, and you can measure that influence. Another way of looking at this is an annual event called the National Prayer Breakfast. You can watch it on C-SPAN if you can. It's very dull. Um, uh, it's been going on since 1953. It was created by the family in 1953 to, as they put it, consecrate the nation and the president to Jesus. Now, the event seems to be ecumenical. If you go, your invitation comes on congressional letterhead. Most of Congress goes. The president always speaks Democrat and Republican. Who's going to say they're against prayer? The Foreign Diplomatic Corps 
comes. They have a few prayers. It's a little, it tends a little bit conservative, but not wildly so. One year, Bono was the speaker. He, that doesn't mean that he's mm. part of this. He doesn't know what this thing is. Right. You look at the internal planning documents of, the, of this event. It says anything can happen. This is a direct quote. Anything can happen. Even the Quran could be read, but it wouldn't matter because Jesus is there. He is infiltrating the world. world. Mm. That's their words. And then you look at how is he infiltrating the world, and... You know, one of the things I did was I said, all right, I'm going to look at the foreign delegations that come to the National Prayer Breakfast. And three times out of four, they're led by the defense minister. Because this event, which is now a week-long event in February in Washington every year, is known as a great big off-the-books off the lobbying fest. And a lot of these foreign defense ministers from small countries, when pressed by the media in their countries, why, you know, some of these countries that are not Christian, why are you spending all this money to go to this strange American Christian event. They're very candid. Yeah, they say, look, this is, you know, how else am I going to get time with the kind of American politicians who, you know, wow. send us weapons? <laughs> That's and scary. Again and again, you see at that the action. Prayer. The book traces some of those, those connections. <laughs> they're meeting at the, at the prayer to discuss yeah, they're meeting uh, at the possible prayer shady record. dealings. Going on. Yeah, yeah one, of, one of them I talk about in the book, uh, this Dennis Backey, and he's... Uh, you know, some of the guys I'm most interested in the ones who believe in this so fully that they don't even bother to, uh, to cover it up a little bit. Mm. So AES, uh, he meets the dictator of Uganda, uh, a guy named Yuwari Museveni. Uh, I think it was back, and I'd have to check, uh, prayer breakfast in the late 90s. These guys hit it off, and they discover that they're brothers in prayer. Museveni owes a lot of his power in Uganda to the long-term support of the Americans involved. Right. And... He decides, that Museveni decides what he's going to do is he's going to give a $500 million no-bid contract for a hydroelectric dam to uh, Dennis Bakke's co company. He's not going to look for any other bidders. He's not going to see anything competitive. Wow. So suddenly they have the hugest energy project in the country. Well, problems immediately start arising, one of which is that the AES decides to cite this uh, on the ancestral lands of one of the few groups in Uganda that are not Christian. And when asked about this, Dennis Bakke responds, he says, I'm a cultural imperialist. Those are his terms. He calls this, I'm a cultural imperialist. I'm making oh. Uganda better. That said, the Ugandan press discovers all kinds of corruption. And here's where, you know, if I wrote this as a short story, you'd say it was too cheesy. It couldn't be done. The, uh, but Dennis Bakke hires a young man, the son of the organizer of the National Prayer Practice, in fact, the son of a chaplain to the House of Representatives, uh, whose name is Christian Wright. Christian wow. Wright is sent to <laughs> dispel the rumors of corruption uh, connected to this project. And what does Christian Wright do? Apparently, he gets right in the mix of it so badly that even the Museveni government has to send him out of the country. He claims his name was forged, and <laughs> Christian Wright, started with a W, uh, was forged on the checks, the bribes he was paying. This is all done in the idea that you were doing this for God, so it's okay. It's okay, you're doing this for God. The normal rules don't apply. The group will even say that. The morality is for little people. It's not for us because we're God's chosen. Wow. What type of immoral behavior is tolerated? Like, is there is there a bar that they can't step over, or is or is pretty much every sort of horrible behavior tolerated? I uh, I say this with a little bit of pride. I believe I am the only person who the family has ever said that's just too much. Jesus just doesn't love you. Jesus cannot love you, and that's significant because some of the people that Jesus has loved <laughs> are people like. Uh, Suhardo, a million dead, Papa Doc, uh, any number of dead. Uh, Sonny Abacha, the late dictator of Nigeria, died in bed with several prostitutes after stealing billions from his oil-rich country. A man who Senator Jim Inhofe uh, prevented the Clinton administration from imposing sanctions on. He led the fight in, co uh, in Congress to prevent sanctions on this guy because he said he is uh, a friend in Jesus. Another guy, uh, who do we have in... Um, uh, um, in Sudan now, we have the first sitting ruler ever indicted for genocide. First time a sitting ruler, while in power, has been indicted by the World Criminal Court for genocide. Leader of the family, man named former congressman named Mark Siljander, uh, recently um, convicted of uh, money laundering. 
um, as a money laundering uh, mm. fraud related to taking money from the Sudanese government, which was uh, Sudanese powers, which were, were paying him to advocate on his behalf, would come back and go on Christian TV, go on Pat Roberts and television, and says, now look, I know you all think this guy is very bad, but I sat with him and he just melted my heart. And I know that Jesus is really in his heart, even though he says he's a Muslim. So, yeah, you can pretty much uh, uh, That's weird. Accept, you can pretty much accept anybody. Let me give it to you in a, in a, in a more sort of down-to-earth form, the way I first encountered him. David Coe, son of Doug, Doug Coe, and another leader of the, uh, the group, a guy who does most of his spiritual counseling for congressmen. He was the one who led Senator Ensign and Mark Sanford through their crises came over to the house where I was living with these, these young guys one time while I was there and wanted to talk about King David. And he talk, wanted to talk about King David. Most listeners may not remember that King David was not always such a good guy, that King David at one point sees this woman that he wants to seduce, uh, has his guards bring her over, depending on how you read the Bible, either seduces her or rapes her. How, either way, it's not good. Uh, and her husband is one of, his, one of his soldiers, one of his captains. So King David arranges to uh, have that captain killed, and does. So uh, leading, opening the door for him to have this woman. Later on in the Bible, he'll repent, but that's not the part they're interested in. And he's telling this story to this group of young men that I was with, and they're all kind of puzzled because they want to be good guys. This doesn't sound good. And they're saying, uh, they, he says, why does God love this guy? Why does God love this guy? And they're con- trying to come up with some sort of moral reading and he wipes it all away. He says, no. He says, because he's chosen. He's chosen for leadership. And when you're chosen, the normal rules don't apply. It's, that's off, off the books, as long as you are loyal to this strong man concept of God. It's a very, very frightening theology. Oh, these people and, believing and that they're chosen by God. You heard it when, uh, you heard it when Mark Sanford, uh, the governor of, uh, uh, of South Carolina, got caught in his affair at first confessed and then rallied through counseling from C Street and said, I'm like King David, so I'm not going to step down because I was chosen for this. I, Senator Sam Brownback, now, Kansas, uh, now governor of Kansas, uh, hoping to run for president one day, you know, I've sat there in small fundraising meetings with him where he explains to people that he has only one constituent. He says he wasn't elected by the people of Kansas. These are the people, same people talking God. about self-entitlements, by the way. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right, right. Well, they don't feel entitled because they say, hey, I'm just a servant. It's a terrible burden on me to be chosen like this. Yeah, right. I didn't ask to be rich. Yeah. God put it on me, and I just, must, I just must bear the weight of this great wealth and power. It, it, mm. It's a very self-serving yeah. uh, idea, but you can see how it's appealing to... Uh, men who do brutal things to, to climb the ladder and then want to feel good about themselves. You've mentioned in past interviews that Hillary Clinton was affiliated with this group? She was what's called uh, a friend of the family, which is not a member. Mm. And uh, it seems like a casual designation, but in fact, uh, within the organization, if you refer to someone the wrong way, people will correct you. Oh, no, no, she's not a member. She's a friend. And that surprised me, too. Now, remember, she's a more conservative Democrat than we know. And, and uh, the journalist Catherine Joyce and I ended up writing uh, about her involvement for Mother Jones magazine. Um, that's also in, in the book The Family. Um, but, and also more religiously conservative than, than, than I think a lot of people realized. Um, you know, when we interviewed, the, she wouldn't talk to us, but we interviewed a lot of people around her and, and people who are close to her religiously, and she talks about rejecting the so-called social gospel, which is the idea that the gospel calls us towards social justice. She doesn't actually believe in that. And there's religious reasons for that. But mm. what this came up with, in, in her autobiography, she uh, refers to Doug Coe. I was skimming through, and I was startled to see her referring to Doug Coe as a genuine spiritual leader uh, in Washington and talking about how Doug Coe had created a all-women's prayer group for her because they believe that prayer... Uh, works best when it's uh, gender segregated um, and mm. com- comprised of, uh, and there's pictures of her yeah. in her own book of, with Jack Kemp's wife, the late uh, Jack Kemp, who oh, yeah. was conservative, uh, Jim Baker's wife, the Jim Baker from the, uh, both Bush administrations, I guess you could say, uh, very conservative. A number of these conservative power broker wives, and they would meet once a week at the family's headquarters in Arlington 
uh, called Cedars early on when she was first lady. Um, now, does this mean she's a stealth fundamentalist? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, you know, I mean, if, if Hillary is running in 2016 against Chris Christie, uh, oh, you know, boy. she's probably got my vote. But uh, it does mean that, uh, that there's ways in which, for instance, the late Christian right leader Chuck Colson involved in the group uh, said, you know, one of the ways, one of the things we appreciate about Hillary is that she was able to come over to us. An example he gave me, and again, this is where we get into sort of the legislative nitty-gritty, uh, has to do with human trafficking or sex trafficking. This is the movement of people as slaves. And those two terms, human trafficking versus sex trafficking, there's a lot of difference in those terms. Progressives want to tackle human trafficking, mm. recognizing that there's all kinds of slavery. The Christian right wants to tackle only sex trafficking, not wanting to deal with workers who are being oppressed. And she decided to go and team up with, with Senator Brownback to work on a sex trafficking bill that ended up becoming so punitive that even the NGOs that are working on this issue said this is a terrible, terrible bill, because what it required them to do was to denounce prostitution uh, if they wanted any federal funds, and to refuse to help prostitutes. To put that in context, suppose an NGO is working in Thailand and a, a 13-year-old girl comes to the organization and she wants condoms to protect herself from HIV. Right. She's getting federal funding, that NGO would have to say no. And I asked Senator Brownback if, you know, would he rather uh, uh, a, a, a young girl like that die then uh, in, in his book, you know, commit the sin of contributing to her sin. And his legislative aide jumped right in and said, yes, it would be better for her to die with her soul clean. Jeez. That's Jeff a Charlotte. cold calculation. That's not oh, Hillary this is Clinton. Cold. But this, it's, it's too cold. Hillary Clinton maybe made, made uh, pragmatic choices that were a little too pragmatic. And, you know, fundamentally, the issue is transparency. This is not a left-right issue. And I should say there's, there are a lot of conservatives who are as critical of the family as I am. In fact, some of the best reporting uh, um, out there came from a fundamentalist magazine, a traditional fundamentalist magazine called World Magazine. It's sort of the flagship Christian right fundamentalist magazine. Very, very conservative. But they don't like people, you know, moving money around off the books. They don't like lying. Mm. And they don't like it when the family, as they often do, compare Jesus to various strong men, dictators of history. They compare them to Stalin, to Hitler, uh, uh, to Ho Chi Minh, and they say Jesus has that same strength, but for good. Oh. Well, traditional fundamentalist says, you know what, there's better comparisons. If you want to use a metaphor for Jesus, you can talk about a lamb, or if you must, you can talk about a lion. But you don't need this kind of viciousness, this kind of rhetoric, which drives you into, in the real world, alliances with actual dictatorial killers. So there's conservatives, there's liberals, there's lefties, there's a lot of people critical of this. It is uh, 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 at, at really at heart, I think, a transparency issue. Jeff Charlotte, our guest on the Black Tower Show. I wish we had more time to talk. Thank you so much for taking the time. Can we have you back on? Because I do want to talk about your newest book, Sweet Heaven When I Die, Faith, Faithlessness, and the Country in Between. 